Welcome, everybody, to the Superfast Instagram Q&A. Let's talk AI. Superfast Instagram Q&A. What do the advancements in AI making cognitive processes mean for the future of music? The time is coming where nobody will be willing to submit themselves to the discipline of actually learning how to play music. Everything will just be ready made for them. Is a paraphrase of a quote by John Philip Sousa, the American March composer, in reference to Thomas Edison's invention of the phonograph. He was immensely suspicious of the idea of recorded music. Now, was he being a complete Luddite? 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 I don't know how to pronounce that word. Luddite? Well, in one sense, no, because general music literacy in the 20th century did go down. Sheet music sales plummeted because people no longer needed to read sheet music to hear music. They could just listen to it played by professionals. New technologies in music always bring some kind of replacement panic, like in the 1990s where computer technology and MIDI threatened the livelihoods of many session musicians. Check out this clip of Anthony Jackson on a German talk show. You know how things have changed. I don't, that's why well, I'm asking you. The machines are here. Now, Anthony Jackson is an absolutely world-class bass player, but at this time, he was being replaced by people who could program bass lines for less money. In this clip, he frames the struggle of musicians against the machines, very much like the tale of John Henry, the man who could outcompete the locomotive or die trying. That's literally how he frames this. My feeling is I'll outplay anybody using the machine or I'll die, I don't care. I, the day that the machine outplays me, they can plant me in the yard with the corn. Uh, and I mean it, I'm very serious. I will not permit myself to be outplayed by someone using the machine. So this is very intense, kind of funny in hindsight because he's shouting all this doom and gloom and Anthony Jackson today still has an amazing career. He's an amazing bass player. You should definitely go check him out. But it does speak to a real thing that happened, the rise of Easily available digital audio workstations on laptops meant that many people lost their jobs and many recording studios closed. And so with all of that in mind, what do we expect from AI and how might it replace human musicians? It's not quite as advanced as AI-generated visual art, but it will get there in the next couple of years. We have things like Jukebox by OpenAI, which can produce reasonable facsimiles of recording artists' recordings. It's not perfect just yet, but it will get there very shortly. And you, you gotta feel the same. Very soon, musicians will start to have to reconcile with the things that visual artists are having to reconcile with. Will Dali, the AI artist, take my job? AI-generated art is already winning awards over human artists. We're watching the death of artistry unfold right before our eyes. Intense stuff, but no more intense than Anthony Jackson's comments about the rise of computers and MIDI. So it's clear that something's going to change somehow, and something might get lost, like with the advent of recorded technology and the advent of MIDI. But as we saw through those revolutions, a great deal of other stuff got added. And so as we sit at the precipice of this next revolution, just remember, we kept playing chess even though computers reliably beat us every time. Why? Well, because it's fun to play chess and it's fun to make music. Shout out to my brother Sam, who will probably see this and probably never know I meant him. Love you. Shout out to Sam, y'all. <laughs> what are the applications of the whole tone scale? To make your music sound like fairy dust. Ooh, good times with the whole tone scale. Am I right? Woohoo! How should beginner musicians get used to playing swing? Beginners are often told that swing is when you have eighth notes, da 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 da, where the second of the two eighth notes is a little bit shorter than the first of the two eighth notes. Da bu ba bu ba bu ba bu ba. That's certainly one part of it, but there's so many other aspects of swing that aren't expressed through that pure mechanistic view of rhythm, like the articulation, the tempo, the vocabulary that you're using. And it all requires a fair amount of diligent study, but there are a couple of things that you can do to get more into the feeling. For example, the two and four trick. Set a metronome to something kind of slow, in this case 60 beats per minute, and then pretend that this is the second and fourth beat of a given measure. And the way you do that is you start counting on beat two. Two, three, four, a one, two, three, four, a one, two, three, 
four. The accent in swung jazz music is on two and four, and by practicing with a metronome this way, this is a classic way of getting into that. There are some mnemonics that can also help get into the articulation of swing music, and this is something that I picked up from Justin DiCocho at the Manhattan School of Music. For slow tempos, and this is gonna sound ridiculous, but it's a great way of getting into it, you say the phrase, doodla. Check it out. <clears throat> It always sounds so ridiculous, but the, the advantage of that is that it's putting a little bit of an accent on those upbeats. And that slight accent on the upbeats is a useful way of getting more into a swung jazz feel. And for faster tempos, you say the phrase, wigglin' a jigglin', a wigglin' a jigglin'. Like this. A wigglin' a jigglin', a wigglin' a jigglin', a wigglin' a jigglin', a wigglin' a jigglin'. These silly phrases can help you get into those feelings, especially since historically, at fast tempos, jazz musicians aren't swinging the eighth notes quite as much as they are in slower tempos. There are always different kinds of articulation patterns and pushes and pulls within the swing, depending on the tempo. When you listen to classic jazz recordings, pay close attention to how the musicians are swinging at what tempo. Like, for example, check out how Art Blakey plays swing on Soul Station, the title track off of Hank Mobley's Soul Station. Listen to how clipped the ride cymbal is. Tss, 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 tss. Right? Woo! But on faster tunes, especially with soloists, the eighth notes are a lot straighter. Listen to how Wynton Kelly plays these eighth notes more or less straight. Like. Good stuff. The blues is, of course, a very big, important part of swing vocabulary as well. This all comes together in a wonderful package. Part of the real magic of listening to old jazz recordings is realizing that swing is not this. It is much more nuanced. There are many more factors that go into it. And I love nerding out about those subtle details in classic rhythm sections, especially one like this one, which is Paul Chambers and Art Blakey. It's good stuff. Good stuff. Gotta love swing. Why did you choose bass? I chose bass not only because it's awesome, but because I get to bully keyboard players and guitarists. If a keyboard player plays a C major chord and I play an A, it is an A minor 7 because you hear the relationship of another instrument to the bass. That's just how our ears work. You hear the thing on the bottom and you think, aha, that's the main event. So no matter how much a keyboard player wants this to be a C, it is an A minor 7. That's power. What do you think separates a professional musician from a really good amateur? Honestly, whether or not you get paid, there's nothing inherently better about a professional musician. It's just they've figured out a way of getting somebody to pay them for their work. That's about it. What value do critics and reviews have in music? So on the subject, Igor Stravinsky would say, I had another dream the other day about music critics. They were small and rodent-like with padlocked ears as if they had stepped out of a painting by Goya. Clearly, Stravinsky was a fan of the critics. Now, some of you might be aware of the food analogy when it comes to music criticism. You don't need to be a chef to know your food sucks, and you don't need to be a musician to know that the music that you're listening to sucks, at least for you. Now, to be a critic of said music slash food, what do you need to have? Now, the great writer George Bernard Shaw, who moonlit as a music critic, said that you need three things. One, a cultivated taste for music. You need to have engaged with a lot of music and have some kind of relationship to the music that you listen to. Two, you need to be a skilled writer. It isn't enough just to listen to music and have feelings about it, but you need to be able to articulate those feelings in a compelling way. And three, you need to be a practiced critic. You need to do this quite a lot to hone your craft. All of this seems reasonable and accurately describes a number of very, very well esteemed music critics. So why did Igor Stravinsky hate them so much? Now for me, I think it's because music criticism is its own entirely unrelated craft to musicianship, and it's weird getting advice from somebody who practices a different craft than you do. If a master musician critiqued my craft, I would have enormous respect for their critique because they practice the same craft that I do, music. If a master music critic critiqued my craft, I would not give a shit whatsoever because they practice music criticism, not music. And that's because music critics are for those who consume music, who place the value on the consumption of music, not the people who create music. And so because of that, I'm so utterly removed from what critics think and how they go about their business because honestly, 
I don't care. And so because of that, as a listener of music, I find music critics very valuable, but as a maker of music, I don't find them particularly valuable at all. Do you have any advice for younger musicians who want to get into music like myself? Three things. One, be a good hang. Being somebody who is positive, who is pleasant to work with, who is professional, is honestly the biggest reason why you might get hired if you want to do this professionally. Two, piggybacking on the last one a little bit, develop a strong sense of emotional intelligence. Be as empathetic as you can be. You're going to be playing with a lot of different people in stressful situations, and if you are aware of their needs and your own needs, that will go a long, long way. And three, find your tribe. Music is a communal activity, and it's important to find your people because you, you're probably going to need a support system. You're going to need friends sometime, and having people that you know you work well with, you know you like making music with, so important. Where does the word jazz come from? Replace the middle vowel with another vowel, and uh, yeah, that's where the word jazz came from. Not kidding on that one, by the way. <laughs> How to play fast and clean. I've been stuck on a song for two weeks playing 90 BPM, original on 130. Hal Galper would say that we are athletes of the fine muscles. And if you're thinking about speed and how much time athletes need to train to run fast or swim fast or bike fast, Two weeks is not much time, so why would it be any different for musical speed? In order to play fast, you need to play slow and deliberately for a long period of time, and eventually, after many, many months, you will get there. But it does take a long time. First time in New York. Cool place to see some live jazz as a local. Just go to Smalls. Uh, there's a reason why that's the jazz club that everybody recommends you go check out. Go check out the late night session. Sit in. Be vibed. How to be great at music while also trying to do marketing, video editing, business, etc. Well, I will say this. There is always a game that you have to play. Mozart and Bach had to play the patronage game. They had to appease their patrons in order to make their music. Musicians of the 20th century had to appease the record labels to which they were signed. That was their game, they had to play that. And musicians in the 21st century have to play the game of social media and algorithms and all of that stuff. Everybody has a game to play. It's right there, and whether or not you choose to engage with it is your choice. But know that there is a game, and it's up to you on whether or not you decide to engage. If you don't engage, that's okay. But that means that you probably won't have the opportunities that you would have if you were engaging in the game. So, since time immemorial, it has constantly been a balancing act between your craft, your art, and the business, and the promotion behind your art. I'm not sure if there's a good answer on how to be great at music, but I will say that I find myself the happiest if I'm able to balance the two so that I make music more of the priority. There we go. Thanks guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please comment, like, and subscribe, and consider joining my Patreon, because it's the patrons over at Patreon that made this particular video possible. So thanks, guys, and until next time, everybody. Peace.